Well, welcome back, everybody. We're uh, we're back for another remote episode of AWM Insights. If you uh, if you're on hopefully the our YouTube last. channel, yeah, hopefully our last YouTube channel. You'll see uh, you'll see at least a little bit of what our homes look like. But uh, hopefully, this will be the last time. Like like Justin mentioned, we'll be back in an office next week. Uh, but for the time being, we'll we'll get going here. So just want to start off at the top, uh, mentioning that phone number again, we're going to get into just kind of what's going on in the news right now. Uh, what are some of the big economic headlines that are keep hitting? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how we're actually uh, managing your portfolio, how we take these things into consideration, but we'd love to get, this is actually a suggestion uh, that did come from one of our listeners. And so we're going to throw that number out again, because uh, we'd love to hear from you guys and see if you have anything you want us to hit on. And then telephone number is 602-704-5574. Shoot us a text and we'll uh, we'll dig into some of the topics like we're going to do today. So Justin, let's uh, let's go there. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that are floating around in the media. One of the big questions we got uh, that generated this, this episode, it was the US dollar and what is happening there. And people are, you know, the pundits are saying it's going to you know, decline or some, you know, another pundit will hop on and say, we're looking at the strength of U.S. dollar. What does all that mean for, for our portfolios? How do we look at some of these big headlines that are they're coming about? So before we jump into that, how we look at the headline, let's make a quick definition of why it's important to be the reserve currency. And there are actually some negative implications to it, but essentially it means that most business in the world is transacted in U.S. dollars. So if you know, somebody from Brazil wants to buy, and this is relevant to the conversation today, but buy a product from China. Typically what happens is you convert your Brazilian currency to US dollars, US dollars to Chinese yuan, and then you get your goods back. And that happens because the US dollar is quote unquote, the reserve currency. It's a reserve currency. And it's been that way for quite some time. The British pound was the, the, previous reserve cur currency when the United Kingdom had vast, vast empires or a vast empire throughout the world. And those two things generally go hand in hand. The strongest economy, the strongest country, generally speaking, becomes the reserve currency. It's a benefit because there's a willing buyer for your currency. There's a willing buyer for your country's debt. But on the, the flip side too, it actually drives your currency up because of, there's that willing buyer there. So it actually hurts some of your import or excuse me, export based manufacturing businesses, service business, et cetera, right? Because it's making your 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 economy more expensive to those outside your borders. Quite honestly, this topic comes up quite often. Uh, you know, every few years I think it it pops back up and and it comes up for good reason, right? Then it's probably been a little bit more frequently as of lately because China is trying to assert some sort of dominance on on the global stage. And there, this is one way in which they can add a talking point or a headline that, let's say, criticizes or pokes at at the bear uh, of the United States, our country here. But in all actuality, this is, let's call it a nothing burger. Uh, and I'll, I could give you a one word answer. I'll, I'll, we'll certainly go beyond that. But the the one word answer is why, why this is a nothing burger is the Chinese yuan is pegged to the US dollar. That literally means that the Chinese currency is a function of the US dollar. It's been that way, uh, I think since 1994, excuse me. Um, they've changed it from a hard peg to a range over time. So it has evolved and it will continue to evolve. Um, but that that kind of gives you the, the answer to, okay, what what is behind the headline here? What's the substance? Should the United States or should I be worried? The short answer is that there's no eminent risk of the United States lose, losing its status as a reserve currency holder. And even if that were the case, which certainly is a potential over or, or over the long term, does that actually have a detriment to your portfolio? It's hard to say. I, I think the short answer would be probably not. I mean, the United Kingdom uh, is a good example. Like I said, that the Great British Pound uh, was a reserve currency for some, some time. And when it lost it, it wasn't necessarily a, a massive detriment to at least companies w within the United Kingdom. So I think 
again, w- we can talk more about the dynamics behind all this and and why this is coming back to it. But really, at the end of the day, the Chinese yuan specifically is pegged to the U.S. dollar, so there really is no immediate risk that the uh, U.S. dollar re- loses its reserve status. No, that's super helpful, Justin. I think you're right to cut to even to the chase at the end of the day, what you're saying is, you know, it doesn't matter all that much, right? When we're planning for your portfolio, when we're investing your money, it's it's a data input, but it's actually one that doesn't move the needle nearly as much as other considerations. Uh, and as we know, when we go back to financial structure, when we're really putting your portfolio together in a way to achieve your priorities, you know, yes, it's a risk factor that the, there's a chance the US dollar you know, gets unseated uh, as the reserve currency, but that's more of a, you know, an issue that we're, you know, part of the risk spectrum when we're looking at uh, growing your assets over time to meet your priorities. And I'd almost analogize it to what's happening in golf right now, right? The U.S. is essentially the PGA. There's the live tour that's come in. They've created some disruption, et cetera. You know, China, the yuan ever is growing, the economy, right? It's it's exciting. People think it's going to threaten the U.S. dollar. You know, maybe the U.S. makes some adjustments. There's a lot of kind of similarities here, but at the end of the day, live uh, still needs to survive and exist. Uh, nobody's going. You don't see every big player jumping over there right now because it's still too risky to go make live the default uh, golf tournament or golf body uh, in the world, right? And so people are going to stick with the PGA for the time being. And that might not always be the case, but you know, at the end of the day, those are the types of relationships that, that may exist. And there's other things, right, Justin, that, you know, yes, the reserve currency piece of it, but a lot of times the strength of the dollar, you know, kind of to go in another direction is dependent on, you know, how easy monetary policy is here in the U S or, you know, you said it, the, the desire for debt. So interest rates, you know, is the Fed going to cut interest rates? Are they going to, you know, potentially as of this morning, you know, there's consideration that we may have another rate hike and all of this is tied to inflation. So maybe even give a, everybody a little bit of an idea there on, hey, maybe these things are related a little bit. And, you know, how do those factor into each other? complexities, I guess is the right word I was trying to reach for there, of the market and rates and currency markets specifically is deep. There, at any given time, what is dominating market forces uh, is as good as uh, your guess as it is mine. You know, we talk a lot about predicting the future and the fool's errand that that it exists. But that being said, interest rates are a a pretty big variable and factor within currency markets specifically, which you're alluding to, and then bringing that back to the local market, the Federal Reserve uses interest rates or the money supply to really control inflation, which has a a knock-on effect on the currency market. There's a, there's, hopefully people are tracking, but there's this, this vicious cycle, this circular loop of information. And one, you change one thing here and you don't know what the impact's going to be over there. And and whatnot. And it's one of the amazing things in the dynamic nature of uh, uh, markets and really one of the reasons you're rewarded for taking risk. But getting to your question specifically around interest rates and what's going on right now, we've talked about this quite, quite a lot. There is a fight against inflation. How that then trickles down to your portfolio is that it's something we thought about three, four, five years Whenever you became a client 10 years ago in your original portfolio construction, construction, the structure of your portfolio trumps economic forecasting. We are setting up a portfolio with the assumption that there will be adversity in the markets. There will be times of, you know, pick your, uh, I don't want to say crisis, but pick your your dominant narrative. Interest rates are up. Earnings are down. We're in a recession. We're in low interest rate period. We're, whatever it is, there's positive and negative forces that can come into the marketplace. Typically speaking, the market climbs a wall of worry and, and you're rewarded for those forces at play. But getting back to the nitty gritty and, and what I was saying is that when we allocate, when we build someone's financial structure, it is with anticipation or or hedging for these p- 
potential outlier event of higher inflation. And we want to do that in parts of the portfolio that matter. What does that actually mean? Well, equities. Equities are wonderful long-term inflation hedging vehicle or stocks. Over a long period of time, stocks have more than outperformed any period of inflation. Is that true over very short periods of time? No. Last year, stocks did not outperform inflation. It's pretty, pretty apparent that that didn't happen. But you're not holding stocks for a one-year period of time to meet a goal or a spending need over a one-year period of time. And so we're matching that asset over a long period of time, and we have confidence it will outpace inflation, amongst other things, and give you a, a higher expected return to match priorities and goals over the long term as well. But then if we bring it more to the present day, we do actually, can we, or I should say, we can actually protect against inflation for more uh, short-term higher priority things. And we use uh, what are called treasury inflation protected securities or inflation protected securities uh, to match up those goals and spending priorities uh, using those type of assets. And those are, those are wonderful things for assets and goals that you don't want to take too much risk. Hey, I really need to, to, I need this money in four years or five years, whatever the case may be, but we need it to also keep up with inflation. Okay. We have a vehicle for that and we're not taking inordinate amount of risk in order to accomplish that. So we're thinking about that unexpected inflation component. We're thinking about interest rates and by matching an asset with a goal interest rates, I don't want to say become irrelevant. They're actually still pretty important, but you have a bond maturing when you need it. Interest rates and market price movements over the, the interim period of time don't matter nearly as much as they do if you're not uh, thinking about portfolio construction in the same way. And I think that's really helpful, Justin. And I think as we just wrap up for today, one thing to to remind everybody about is, you know, what we're not saying is that we're not paying attention to all of these different things factors like Justin's saying is we're actually you know taking those factors into account when we initially build your portfolio we build your structure and then we're allowing evidence to inform us your and then your priorities to inform us on the way that the portfolio should be structured from an expected return type standpoint and so you know all these are are, are important factors over the longer period of time and will have different impacts on the different uh, investments within your portfolio, whether they're oriented for growth and long-term priorities, or like Justin said, you know, where we need to mitigate the risks of big changes of these over the short term, and we're using certain vehicles like inflation protected securities. So, you know, hopefully you guys take away from this that there is a very thoughtful approach. But when you hear these news headlines popping all over the place, you know, I think they're things that hopefully you take with a little bit of a grain of salt. We know the evidence says that you can't predict these things. You can't even really adjust on on a quick fly to these different events and make predictions and try to take advantage. You try to play all those games, you often lose. So, you know, what we're saying is that we are paying attention, but there are greater dynamics that go at play. And that's what we're taking into account when we're ultimately building building your portfolio. And so, like I said, at the top of this episode, we'd love to hear from you guys. If there's any other topics you'd love us to hit on, uh, that telephone number to shoot us a text again is 602-704-5574. And until next time, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.